Welcome to the program and thank you so much for tuning in. I'm your host, Neil Howard, here on Health Professional Radio. In our series on the 2017 Scientific Sessions, our guest is Dr. Jag Singh. He's Associate Chief Cardiology Division and also a founding director of the Resynchronization and Advanced Cardiac Therapeutics Program at Mass General. Uh, Welcome to the program, Dr. Singh. Thank you, Neil. It's a pleasure to be on here, and I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, As you correctly alluded to, I'm the Associate Chief of Cardiology uh, here at Mass General Hospital, uh, also a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, uh, and uh, uh, I am an electrophysiologist by trade. uh, So that basically means I deal with uh, heart rhythm disorders as well as heart failure. Uh, I implant devices in patients with heart failure or heart rhythm disorders, as well as do catheter ablations uh, for a lot of these uh, rhythm disturbances. Now, recently you uh, presented at the American Heart Association's Scientific Sessions 2017. Oh, absolutely. Uh, So uh, I had the opportunity uh, to speak at a futuristic session as to where is the field of electrophysiology uh, moving forth. And the topic that had been uh, given to me was really connecting life to devices as to, you know, how are we evolving in the field where device therapy can be remotely monitored and managed uh, at the same time, you know, how do, how do futuristic sensor and wearable technology integrate with uh, managing patients' uh, uh, in current day practice, as well as how it will kind of uh, come into play in the future. So just to kind of give a little bit of backdrop to this, uh, I think it's important to recognize that uh, there has been a progressive increase in cardiovascular chronic diseases that is largely in the uh, incidence of atrial fibrillation and heart failure uh, and uh, diseases like that that have increasingly, uh, I would say, burdened the national exchequer. And if you look at the the data on, on how we spend our money, uh, three out of four dollars are averagely spent on patients with chronic diseases. Um, and, and, and there has been a progressive, uh, I would say, evolution within the field that we're trying to move our you know, inpatients to the outpatient arena and move our outpatients back to their homes where we can actually manage them in their homes effectively with, with some of the current strategies that we have in play but being better connected to them through devices, whether these devices are implantable or whether these devices are wearable, uh, which, as we know, are fairly trendy at this point in time. Uh, So that's the backdrop. Uh, Now, as where do I fit in as a, as an, uh, you know, as an electrophysiologist? And the answer to that is, you know, electrophysiology is a field that involves implanting devices in patients for heart rhythm disorders, if they have too slow or too fast a heart rate, they often get a pacemaker or, or sometimes they may get an implanted, uh, implantable defibrillator. Now, these devices uh, uh, are implanted for current clinical situations, but these devices also have, I would say, sensors within them. They have sensors that can measure heart rate and its derivatives. Uh, they, can, they have accelerometers within within the device that can actually measure physical activity, measure motion, measure respiration. Um, and they have many other uh, sensors that can measure heart sounds and, and I would say, as I just mentioned, respiratory trends, uh, as well as impedance-based measures that can often predict which patients are going to develop heart failure. So, so electrophysiology as a field got to this space uh, a lot earlier than I think uh, many other fields. Um, and has provided us with the backdrop of how these sensor-based strategies with, uh, with uh, implanted within these devices can help us monitor patients uh, as well as risk stratify patients uh, and to potentially prevent admissions after risk stratifying these patients. So that's, that's where the implantable field uh, comes into play. Um, now, now, having said that, I think there's this whole trend for wearable technology. And if you just kind of look at the way uh, uh, this is, I would say, increasingly been adopted, to give you some numbers, there are about 350 different wearable devices. Uh, and there are about 35,000 different healthcare apps that exist right now with almost, I believe, 200 being added on on a daily basis. So a lot of apps and a lot of devices, but how do we actually, you know, use these devices to provide better care to our patients? And can these devices that are wearable devices 
be integrated with with uh, you know uh, implantable devices. So so you know I, I think it's not unreasonable to kind of give the uh, you know a, a favorite analogy uh, of of comparing the human body to to the motor car right. So cars, as we know, have sensors. Uh, these sensors give a, a second to second uh, I would say feedback loop of data as to how the engine is working. Um, and accordingly, there are adaptive changes happening on a second-to-second -second basis within the cars. Uh, at the same time, uh, these cars also have check lights that give us an idea of what the chronic maintenance of the of the engine needs to look like, and when these engines need to be kind of, uh, you know, examined and and uh, re-oiled and retooled. Uh, so, so there are sensors that help us in acute management as well as chronic management, and and. Somewhat along the same lines, there's a thought that variable sensors or implantable sensors can help digitize the entire human body, um, where information from any organ system can potentially help us monitor how patients are doing. And just to give you an example of the simplest one, which is the watch, right? Uh, and, I, and I think all of us recognize that a watch which is variable can provide us information about the heart rate, uh, the pulse, the blood pressure. Uh, it can give you an idea of what the temperature is. It can give you an idea of what the level of activity that a person is engaged in. Now, there are also newer strategies from the watch that can help us understand the sleep stages. So whether patients have sleep apnea or other sleep disorders, uh, these are sensors uh, within the watch that can help pick up uh, some of these, uh, some of this information. Um, along with this also, you know, this may sound fairly esoteric, but this already exists. Uh, watches along with some sensor strategies can help us understand what the blood glucose level is, uh, cardiac output is, and EKGs, as well as stroke volumes and the like. So there's, so, so you know, to kind of, uh, in a nutshell, there are lots of information out there. Uh, some of it is, I would say, immediately practical. Uh, it can be implemented, and some of it, I think, is still esoteric, and we're trying to figure out how we can integrate that into existing care. So, so that's some of the things that I spoke about at, at the at the symposium. One of the things I did mention, you know, these watches, uh, uh, there's, there's an app, for example, called the Alive Core app or the Cardia app that can help, uh, you know, when you press your thumbs on, on this app, uh, it can actually give you a live EKG. And, and I, for one, manage more than a couple of patients internationally who actually use this app and transmit their EKGs to me on a weekly or two-weekly basis so I can see whether they're in atrial fibrillation or not. So, so there's a lot that you know potentially can be done in the future uh, using wearable devices as well as implantable devices to help monitor our patients, risk stratify our patients, prognosticate them, and then subsequently, I would say, uh, also help uh, manage them uh, in a more proactive fashion. Some of the biggest barriers, I think, are you know how do we deal with all this information? Uh, that's one of the big questions that comes up. And second is how do we integrate uh, all this information into our electronic health system? And I think that's, again, a big issue because you can have many vendors and how does, how does the data from all these vendors and wearable devices find their way into our electronic health records uh, for common consumption analyses and then, you know, uh, uh, implementing therapies? So I think that's that's a whole uh, issue uh, that needs to be dealt with. I think uh, personally, I feel that there are many apps, but there will be just a fraction of them that will eventually become clinically uh, useful. Uh, I think they will need to be time tested uh, through research and clinical trials. Uh, and the ones that stand the test of time will then find their way of getting integrated into electronic health records where they can be used for monitoring patients and providing better care. So, so there's a lot of, uh, I would say, work that needs to be done out there. And, and I think one of the things that we've all heard about is deep learning and artificial intelligence. And I think when we have this whole, uh, I would say, large amounts of data finding their way into the system, we'll need to obviously also work on the deep learning and artificial intelligence side of things so that we can have, you know, implementable actions uh, based off what we derive from this data. So, Neil, that's kind of an overview of where implantable sensors are and where, I would say, 
uh, wearable sensors are and how they need to be integrated in the future. So it was a futuristic talk. Where can we go and learn some more about the American Heart Association scientific sessions this year and uh, in previous years as well? So you can certainly, uh, I would say, from the American Heart, there there's a website for the American Heart Association where they actually have clips of uh, all the talks as well as, uh, I would say, links for different uh, sessions and uh, certainly for this session. Uh, at the same time, I think, uh, you know, much of this is uh, also, uh, you know, your, your uh, radio show will certainly help uh, spread the message that this is the direction. So I think there, and there obviously there'll be published uh, literature from the American Heart Association that will be accessible too. Well, I appreciate your time. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Jag Singh. Thanks a lot, Neil. Bye-bye. You've been listening to Health Professional Radio. Transcripts and audio of the program are available at healthprofessionalradio.com.au and also at hpr.fm. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, listen in, and download at SoundCloud. And be sure and visit our affiliates page at hpr.fm and healthprofessionalradio.com.au.